I was trying to guess by the picture of who, which group it's going to be. I got that one. <laughs> Welcome to Colonial Church today. My name is Aaron Roberts, and on a week where we have seen so much, I am glad that you are here, here together to worship this morning. And as we begin this time together, in each one of our pews, we have a pew pad. Take that out. Place your name in that and pass that to whoever might be sitting next to you. And if you don't know who's sitting next to you, be sure to introduce yourself and greet them this morning. Also, importantly, if there is a prayer that you would like to share with our church community as a whole, please fill out one of those prayer, uh, prayer cards and then place that card in the offering plate later in the service. I'd like to draw your attention to several of our announcements. All of these can be found in our bulletin along with several others. T the, today is Surprise Sunday. Surprise! 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 So stick around after the service in the narthex for a surprise that awaits you. In our bulletin, you will find a weekly giving calendar for one great hour of sharing. And so I hope you will take time to look through that. This is a Lenten piece that can be used by you or your family throughout the Lenten season. But it's a way to focus our hearts and minds towards giving in times of need. Also, Trivia Night is coming up, and so please, if you do not yet have a team, I've got three seats at my table. Form a team amongst yourselves. Um, it's a very joyous and fun fellowship event, so we hope you will come and participate. Finally, in this season of Lent, which began on Ash Wednesday, which is our first Sunday of Lent today, there are a few changes and tweaks to our order of worship that I'd like to draw your attention to. First, rather than our traditional call to worship, we will be having a short meditative moment. Second, the words to our doxology are shifting a slight bit. The tune will remain the same, but the, the words to the third line will change. I won't even try because I'll mess it up. But the words will be on the screen and they're in your bulletin, so pay attention when the doxology comes. And the tone of worship shifts slightly. We start in a slower, more meditative mood and then move toward joy as the service ends. So please pay attention to these things and check your bulletin for the events in the life of the church. In our Bible, there are four recorded accounts of the life of Jesus of Nazareth. But we have a little video because, according to Sesame Street, we have to account for something. So, do you have? Do you have? Ah. It's the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is not like the others. It's different. It's beautifully written both in Greek and in English translations. But there are many things about it which kind of will make me honestly feel a little uneasy. I'll be honest, John is not my go-to gospel. It is not the one that is not the first one that I would turn to. So during this season of Lent, we are going to be paying particular attention to the gospel of John. To understand it in the context in which it was written, as much as we know about the writer of the gospel of, of John, and also to see its message of hope. Hope for a divided wor world that makes it so powerful. Our, noon, our Thursday noon Bible study for the next couple months is going to be looking particularly at the Gospel of John. If that's something you can take, you can come here to the church at noon, or you can do it online if you want to, if you want to connect to it that way. But we are going to be concentrating on John for a while too. So if this is something that you'd like that message of hope or to look, learn more about it, please take part in that on Thursday, Thursdays at noon too. Today we're going to start with an overview of why... The, go the jo Gospel of John is the uneasy gospel. It's been used, and I'm going to say that it has been abused, for the, tr for the tool of anti-Semitism. Yet beyond the uneasiness of this gospel, there is a message of hope for people who are living in divided times, for people who see their world fractured into sectarian, in, into sectarian groups, and it is the core of that hope 
that we come together on this Sunday to center in around our worship. So let's come into this time of, uh, time of worship by preparing our bodies and our minds and our souls. So let's take a moment now to begin. If you feel like it, clo please close your eyes. Spirit is breath. It fills us. Breathe in deeply. This is the fresh air that renews your life. Now breathe out what is stale. Now do that again. I hope that this time of worship renews your spirit as you let go of the stale burdens you are carrying. And so in the spirit of hope and renewal, let's worship. Throughout our worship this day, we experience it first in our opening hymn. I invite you to stand as you are able to join me in singing, O God, How We Have Wondered. It is number 202 in our hymnal, and it is set to the tune of Herzlich tut mich verlangen. Please sing with us. Please be seated. Sisters and brothers, in our daily lives, we need the gift of the season of Lent. 
These 40 days can help us restore right relationships with God and with others. This is a time, fine time to focus, clear our hearts and minds of distractions, and reorient and restore our whole selves. May God be with us. Let us pray. Creating and renewing God, in this Lenten season, clear our eyes of the glaze of indifference and apathy. Help us rid our minds of distractions, obsessions, and self-pity so that we don't feel helpless. Help us to start over, reorient head and heart so that we may fill our whole selves with life-affirming activities and thoughts. Our confession continues in a moment of silence. Brothers and sisters, God hears our prayers and even in our human frailty, promises to be with us in the wilderness times. During this season, we will observe, find comfort and offer with courage to restore and build relationships amongst God's people. In this, we are blessed, amen. Please stand if you're able. it is good to be together on a day when the sun is shining, the birds are chirping, and babies are talking. Will you take a moment to greet all those gathered here? morning. You know, we talk an awful lot about love your neighbors as yourselves. And I run kind of go over that and, and talk a little bit more about that because I think that's an important thing that we talk about. So Jesus gives us a couple of real simple ways of putting all this into perspective. He says, really, the Ten Commandments can be broken into two categories. Love God with everything that you have and love your neighbors as yourself. So things like, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Um, Don't worship any other gods but me. Those are all the God category. You know, give everything that you have to God. Love God with everything that you have. All the others, the things like, don't murder. 
don't steal, um, don't lie, honor thy father and thy mother. Those are the things that go into the category of honoring or um, uh, uh, loving your neighbors as yourselves. So to put this into perspective, if I said to you, hit yourself, would you do that? Okay, you might. You might, because you think it's funny. But you probably wouldn't do it hard enough to hurt yourself. And if you wouldn't hurt yourself, then why would you hit somebody else and hurt them? Right? You wouldn't steal from yourself. That would be weird, right? So why would you steal from somebody else? Did you know that your parents were your neighbors? It's kind of an odd concept, but they really are. You know, you want yourself to be heard and respected, and so do they. So part of honoring your father and your mother means listening to them, respecting them, and following their rules, right? How about at school? Everybody around you are your neighbors. That means the little quiet ones that sit in the corner. Maybe it's the ones that the kids don't really like or talk to. Maybe it's the bullies, but they're all your neighbors, and you should be respectful to them and be kind to them, right? So all these rules can be summed up in those two basic things. Love God with everything that you have and love your neighbor as yourself. So let's take a minute and pray. Loving God, thank you for rules. Thank you for guidance. Amen.
burst into applause on that one. This week, uh, <laughs> choir, I got to tell you, after a week like we've had, we look out at a world and say to ourselves, where will our help come from? And friends, I've sat there and said, it is not in the, in the hope, our hope is not in mortals and in princes in whom there is no hope. There is a hope that is greater than us, and you just sang for that, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Went back and I checked, and it was about seven years ago. We had a guest preacher here one Sunday while I was away on vacation, and I, went and I listened to the message, and it was a simple and direct message. She simply wanted to have the Gospel of John removed from the Bible. Now, I haven't had her back to preach. But her reasoning was that there was just so much in that particular account of Jesus' life, life that it would be just solve the problem if we just removed it, got rid of it, dismissed it. Okay. Now, that certainly is a direct approach. And... I've never fully responded to it. I kind of I thought, should I say anything about this? And I thought, no, I'm not going to say about thing about that. I'll wait seven years. Um, <laughs> but I haven't forgotten about it either. Because the truth is that even though I disagree with her, the Gospel of John does make me a little uneasy. It's by far the most beautifully written of the Gospels. It's got style, both in Greek or English when you read it. It's beautiful. And uh, of, the, of the accounts of Jesus' life, it's very likely, of the four that we have in the Bible, it's very likely the last one that was written. It was written in about the year 100, give or take a decade. And it's different. So Mark, the earliest gospel, the Jesus you have in the earliest gospel of Mark usually keeps his identity secret. They call it the messianic secret. In fact, when people start guessing at who he is, Jesus tells them not to, not to say that to anybody. Now in John, Jesus will tell anybody in their dog that he is the son of God. Starts from, the, from chapter one. It is there. So very different approaches on how they perceive what was happening. Now throughout the centuries, scholars have treated John differently. We divided a cycle of readings based on the four Gospels, but we only gave them three years. They're called years A, B, and C, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John doesn't get a year because it's different. But as one of my Bible instructors once said, don't worry about John. John gets all the big holiday readings, so they'll get it. So as we approach the season of Lent this year, we're going to stick close to John's gospel throughout. We're going to consider some of the stories that are unique to just John and things that you know, like who should cast the first stone? John 7, it's there. We have the story of Jesus turning water into wine? John, only place you're going to find those stories. Our Thursday noon Bible study, we are going to focus on John and that too. So if you're around on Thursday, come to that. And today, today we're going to consider why John makes people like me feel a little uneasy. So here's something I do sometimes. I do something because I'm curious about sometimes how people respond to it. I do something I call Jews, Jews. Because I noticed something when I was growing up. I was really taught you didn't talk about, you didn't say that person is a Jew, or you didn't refer to a group of Jews as the Jews. It just seemed kind of wrong. And so I would put myself through all these verbal gymnastics to say, like, well, if I saw somebody, you wouldn't say, oh, this is my friend Aaron, he's a Jew. I'd say he's Jewish. Or I'd say, oh, he goes to a Jewish synagogue. But I didn't want to call him a Jew. And so go with me on this. We have a Jewish congregation, Temple Sinai, that meets here at Colonial Church every Friday evening. They have Torah study on Thursday. Their rabbi, just a wonderful man. And 
our prayers, when we pray for those people with cancer or other ongoing life-threatening condition, we pray for their congregation too, as they pray for us. And somewhere along the line, I learned that it was wrong or in bad taste to say the Jews. You would, you'd say something like, you know, to say, hey, the Jews need the Oberlin room down the hallway on Wednesday. It, it just doesn't sound right. Something sounds wrong with it. It sounds kind of racist even. And a few years ago, a Jewish friend of mine, it was actually the guy that introduced Carrie and I, noticed that I was struggling with the words Jews, I was call, that he was a Jew. And he said, Aaron, it's okay. I'm a Jew. You can just say it. Try it with me now. Jew. And I, and so now I do. And I get strange looks from other Christians sometimes because it doesn't sit right with us. And do you know what it is? What it's about? It's the gospel of John. The writer of John uses the Greek word for the Jews 63 times. And of those 63 times, half of the time that he uses, a little over half of the time, it's hostile. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. The Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, Where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people. While some said, He is a good man, others said, No, he is leading the people astray. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. You, children of Abraham, are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks according to his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. It's just a sampler. There are dozens of more examples. Can you see then why saying the Jews feels like an ethnic slur, kind of racist? The word Jew has even been used with a, with a meaning as a verb, and it would mean to treat, trick, or to cheat someone. Actually, in the hallway after the service, I told the story about what happened to me as a kid. One of the things, um, when I was in fifth grade, because this six my, my mother was not a violent person, but I remember one time we were, I was playing basketball, and I, there's a thing in basketball where you fake to go one direction and go the other, and you, it's called to juke somebody. She thought I had said to ju, uh, to juke somebody. She slapped me across the face, and she said, you never, ever speak that way. She said, your grandfather was one that saw the concentration camps. I didn't know what I had done wrong. But what I learned was, is that that word, to use the word, the Jews, carried power. And it's more than just Mel Gibson's drunken rants where he gets caught on television uh, blaming the Jews for being responsible for all the wars in the world. His Passion of the Christ movie, which was based on the Gospel of John, where rather than identifying a small group of Jewish collaborators working with the Romans, John ha- he uses John where it's the Jews acting collectively for this, to have Jesus killed. It's stuff like that that has brought centuries of the charge of Christ killer against Jews. So can you see why this would make a person like me feel a bit uneasy? That all said, I in no way think that the Gospel of John is not worth reading and studying. In fact, it is for that reason that I think it's important to explore. And that starts with knowing a little something about the context in which it was written. Now, like I mentioned before, John is the last biblical account of the life of Jesus of Nazareth. In the decades after Jesus' life, 
Jews and Christians were one community. Jews and Christians, they worshipped in the same places. They had the same holidays. After all, Jesus was a Jew. It made perfect sense. Why would Christians not practice religion like Jesus? But after the Romans destroyed the temple, Judaism changed a lot. And this was a time of divisions. People broke into sectarian groups with people who agreed with them, who shared something in common, be it eth- uh, Jew eth- ethnicity, you were a Galilean Jew, or you, and they were, the Jewish world was splitting up. In fact, they were moving away from, from, from the area around Jerusalem. And the writer of John is part of a Jewish Christian community that's outside of Jerusalem that is in the process of breaking up. The writer of John was a Jew who was hurt by the separation. It's the pain of rejection. This is the context of him referring to the Jews. Now, in our time, we know nothing about these kind of divisions. Except for those who have known the sting of broken marriages. Except for those of us who have been labeled in politics rhinos or dinos, Republicans or Democrats in name only except for those of us who have been estranged from our parents, who have been unfriended, dismissed, excluded. The pain of rejection hurts. And to know that, To know the context that the writer of John was writing from, it helps, I think. It helps to understand a little bit better the personal pain that John is writing from. To take it out of context and then to enlarge it, to say that the Jews were Christ killers, that would be abhorrent to John. These were his people, his family, Yes, he was writing from a place of pain, of rejection. But I cannot believe that he, the one who felt the promise of Easter, the pain of the cross in his very being, that he ever would have wished that on the Jews. Never. It was the same John who accounts for this prayer of Jesus. I'm not praying only for them, but also for those who believe in me because of their word. I pray they will be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. I pray that they also will be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. This prayer of unity, of oneness, springs from the personal pain of rejection with the hope, the vision of healing and unity. This prayer is the motto of the United Church of Christ, that all may be one. This is the good news for us today as we face the divisions of our time. Divisions of race, of religion, of politics, of gender and sexual orientation, of money and class. We bear witness to the hurt of separation. You see it. And in spite pain that we are witnessing, we dare to continue the prayer that all may be one, 
that there is a fundamental spiritual power of unity. And just like the, jo- the writer of John needed it in his day, we need to pray for a little bit of that today. We need to work for a little bit of that hope today. Certainly the body isn't one part, but many. If the foot says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not a hand, does that mean it's not part of the body? If the ear says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not an eye, does that mean it's not part of the body? It is too easy to cut yourself off today, to dismiss people, to dismiss opinions that aren't yours, to dismiss whole writings of scripture because you don't like them. Because somebody or something makes you feel uneasy. It is too easy to dismiss people. I proclaim that we are still one body, one humanity with a need for common good for all. Even though there are many and differing parts It is from unity, from that that serves the common good, and from only that infinite um, diversity and infinite combinations that we reflect the image of God, the image that was placed into our very being. And I want to hold on to that in this life. Just like the writer of John was writing in his time of pain and divisions, he held on to a belief of the unity that could be. Christ Church, we have that message deep in our bones. And it needs to be shared today. So now I ask you to please rise up, singing the prayer. Help us, help accept each other, which is number 388 in our hymnal or on screen. Please rise.
You may be seated. Psalm 25:10 reminds us all the paths of God are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep God's covenant and decrees. Our church's ministries are extensions of God's love and faithfulness made possible through the generous giving of our time, energy, and money. With love, let us offer our gifts to God.
please rise in body or spirit. me in our prayer of dedication. God of all bounty and blessing, receive our lives and our gifts to be bounty and blessings to you, our church and the world. Amen. Coming together in prayer is more than just any one of our individual conversations with God. It can be an act of unity, of sharing that can bring us closer to God and to one another. And each week, our church community comes together around the prayers that people have sent in over this last week. And after each prayer, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and can we pray it together, saying, hear our prayer. It's been a heavy week. This, this, our, our area around here this week holds in its heart Alex Carney, the young man who was just killed down the street this way a little bit. His, he died two days ago, and Alex's spirit is with the Lord, but there is so much pain. The driver of the car, he was responsible for, for driving while his buddy died. He's been on suicide watch. We have families that are acting out of grief and pain and anger. And so this, and, and students in our area who are hurt, parents who don't know what to say. And in all of this, we turn to a God because there is a power bigger than any of us, and we need that power. Lord, in your mercy. And this is the middle you're dealing with that. Then you have the news out of Parkville, Florida. 17 children killed in yet another shooting. And this morning, I'm going to go a little off script. This morning I come in and I say a prayer of unity. And so we talk about this unity and I want unity. In fact, at this point, I don't think pain is going to get there. We've seen the pain. We see these shootings happening again and again and pain isn't doing it for us. I am looking for some resurrecting grace. A message that is bigger than anything I can figure out because I don't know what the answer is. I don't think anybody does. But what I do know is, is that there needs to be a movement to unity because I'm tired of this. I am tired of watching children get killed. So if, all I can say is, is that right now, I don't care what are, where you're at on issues, but right now is a time we need to just love people. There can't be children that are dismissed and, for, and pushed off into the side of the world. There can't be people with differing opinions that just we cut ourselves off from. There has to be a sense of that unity. If there is anything out of the message this morning that you take with you, I hope you pray for that unity in whatever way God can bring it. Lord, in your mercy. So what I've been doing is I've been kind of grasping on to little pieces of joy where I can get it. Because you know what? You take it where you can. So this week I've had a few pieces of joy, and one of those pieces was even in the midst of the tragedies of Ash Wednesday, I got to celebrate love. Carrie Frazier and Lucius Barber, I got to unite them my first Valentine's wedding. You know what? I will take the joy where I can get it. I hope you can too, because we need to hang on to that, because that is what we share as well. It isn't just the tragedy, it's also the joy. So let's celebrate that. Lord, in your mercy. Is there a person with whom you are feeling distant this morning? Is there somebody that you feel like your relationship is estranged from? I invite you now to pray for that person. No matter where you're at, I ask you to ask God to bless that person. May that be the start of healing. Let's take a moment now of silent prayer together.
in our community's continuing prayers. We continue to keep all people who are living and serving in the middle of war in our prayer, and we ask for the Holy Spirit to keep them safe and to help all of us find a path to peace. And for caregivers, and for those living with dementia, may they receive the respect and the love that they deserve. And we pray for God's guidance for this nation's ideals of freedom and justice for all people in these turbulent times. And we pray for all people who are living in the shadow of depression or mental illness, and we ask for God's light of hope to shine. And for those immigrants and refugees who are far from the land they knew, we ask for safety and compassion to come from Christ Church. And for the loved ones in our lives who are with cancer and other ongoing life-threatening conditions, we pray for Evelyn Johnson, Heather Rubesh, Sean Bolter, Betty Joyce, Caleb Ball, Andrew Wood, Kelly Hokinson, Nathan Green, Elena Thorne, Mark Tavault, Timothy McDonald, and Lee Frommelt. And we ask for God's strength to flow from our prayers to them. We come together now to you and are united in a prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In this Lenten season, we will hold on for joy. We will breathe deep the hope of God, and we will push back when the world pushes in against us. For as people of faith, that is our call, to live that hope, to share that hope, to be the change. Our closing hymn this morning reminds us that even in the midst of all the hurt and all the pain, yet we can still rejoice. Will you stand as you are able and join me in singing Rejoice, You Pure in Heart, number 55 in our hymnal. God, the 
friends rejoice because no matter what darkness we face, we still have that vision of what is possible, that world to come, that vision of togetherness and unity. It is still there. Proclaim that. The pain and the anger that can come with being cut off or dismissed, it is real. We live with that. Healing, though, comes when we rediscover that we are still one body, one humanity with a common good and our need to find that in our time. It is only in that way, with all of our diversity, that we reflect the true image of God that is poured into our bones. I hope you've heard a word today that in the middle of all of this that there is hope. There is hope for a healing that this world is crying out for. And I hope that you move into the days ahead as an ambassador of that hope. The words of Jesus that we covenant each week being part of your life's journey. We turn now toward the center aisle as we make that. And as always, if you're not at a point in your life where you feel like you can make these words your own, that is perfectly fine. Please receive them as a blessing and a prayer that someday you will. We covenant with the Lord and with one another and do bind ourselves in the presence of God to walk together in Christian love. We seek to worship God in spirit and in truth and to love our neighbors as ourselves. With God's help, we will honor Colonial Church in our conduct, support its program, and extend the influence of time of worship is now over, but our time to go and proclaim hope begins now. So go in peace and live passionately and love faithfully and celebrate every moment of life that you are granted from now until your life's finale. Because our God of resurrecting grace goes with you always and forever. Amen.